Uh, hi, good afternoon. Um, today I want to go quite slowly over perfect things on personal identity. And I, I want to try to bring out just how powerful perfect argument is that we don't really care about identity. But in fact, for all of us, the survival of this particular person is not an important idea. Um, I want to go over it quite slowly and bring out the full for try to bring out the full force of Parfit's idea. So I'll be trying to channel Parfit as well as I can. Um, partly because I just don't see how it can be correct, Parfit's view. And that's what I'll do on Thursday. I'll try to explain why. It seems to me Parfit's view simply must be wrong. But on the other hand, as we'll see today, there are really powerful reasons to think that it simply must be right. Um, so what I very much hope is on Thursday um, you will help me sort this out. Because I, <laughs> I really think, I mean, with consciousness, it, it is kind of obvious the minute you mention the notion that this is a very difficult th thing, the mind-body problem and so on. With personal identity, it's not quite so obvious that there are real hard contradictions here in the way we ordinarily think about it. But I'll try to bring out on Thursday that that's so. So today I'll start out by just going over, explaining again these notions of continuity and connectedness that Parfit uses. He uses them as tools in explaining what identity means. And then look at the implications of these fission cases, the cases where there's branching for what we say about identity. And then finally come on to the main topic, the concern to survive. Okay, that's the plan. So continuity and connectedness. Connectedness is, um, it came up before in discussion that uh, when you're thinking about your memory going back to your past life, there might be all kinds of gaps in your memory. Your memory of your life from a year ago can be patchy, disconnected. Um, you remember some things but not others. Uh, in six months, some of these things might come back to you. But the idea of psychological connectedness is to go for something very sh relatively short term and quite immediate. So we say that these might be just five minutes apart or a minute apart, time t1 and time t2 here. So x at some time t1 is psychologically connected to um, y at some earlier time t2. Uh, and let's suppose t2 and t1 are pretty close together. Um, psychological connectedness means the overwhelming majority of X's psychological states at the later time directly causally depend on Y's psychological states at the earlier time. Right, so presumably we've all right in this room got that from moment to moment, right? You, you, you've got that very direct causal connection. You don't usually have very rapid jumps um, in your psychological life from moment to moment. And then continuity is when you've got a chain of connectedness. So X at time T2 is psychologically continuous with Y at an earlier time T2. Sorry, X at time T1 is psychologically continuous with Y at some earlier time T2. And now the two times can be as far apart as you like if there's a chain of psychological connectedness linking uh, the uh, later time back to the earlier time. You see what I mean? Yeah. So th 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 that's a way of dealing with that problem of patchiness and so on. That's plain enough. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> well, when you're asleep is a difficult case. Um, um, it, many of your psychological states you still have while you're asleep, right? If you are a good-hearted, good-willed person, that's a psychological characteristic you have, and you still have that while you're asleep. Yep. Um, if you have happy memories of your childhood, you don't lose them while you're asleep. It's true that you don't have any psycho active psychological life going on, or not a relevantly active psychological life going on while you're asleep. But lots of these ca psychological characteristics we're looking at, you still have while you're asleep. Yep. That's an important question. Okay. Okay. 
So the special case of psychological connectedness we focused on was quasi-memory. How, how is quasi-memory different from regular memory class? You don't have to have been there. Very good, yes. It doesn't have to have been one and the same person. That's not part of the definition. Yeah. Um, so that's a special case of causal, conne of causal connectedness, psychological connectedness. Um, uh, uh, you've got this later impression that things were so because things earlier were so, but you didn't have to be there at the time. And that's how we get around that problem of circularity. Yeah? Okay. Um, and the way to remember what quasi-memory is, is always to think of that example of brain slides. Right? If I can drop a brain slide into your head, that gives you a quasi-memory of what happened back then. Just one other exercise. Are quasi-memories memories? Are all your quasi-memories memories? Put up your hand if you think the answer is no. Put up your hand if you think the answer is yes. Right. The correct answer is yes. Right. Um, I say this to the three people who <laughs> put up their hands uh, for yes. Well done. <laughs> okay. I remember, a quasi-memory is just like a memory, except you didn't have to be there. But if you were there, well, all right. That doesn't stop it being a quasi-memory. Yeah? Okay. See, it's easy, right? <laughs> right. So okay. all you did is subtract that clause, you had to be there. Okay? So naturally, if you meet the two conditions that were left, well, um, if you meet the two conditions, if you meet all three conditions, then you meet the two conditions that were left. Yeah. So, sorry, I put that around the wrong way. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> let's take this from the top. Let's erase the last, let's erase, uh, uh, look at this as being taped. Let, let's erase the last couple of minutes. I asked you if all quasi-memories were memories, didn't I? Yeah, that's not what I meant to ask you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was the wrong answer when you said yes. You, you three guys, that was completely wrong. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, oh, well. <laughs> Another jolt to my bust of credibility. Um, <laughs> right. Okay, let's take this from the top. Um, okay. Are all quasi-memories memories? You've got to meet two conditions to be a quasi-memory, right? You've got to meet an extra condition to be a memory, right? So if you meet the two conditions, there's no guarantee that you also meet the third condition, right? So not all quasi-memories are going to be memories. Yes? That's perfectly clear. <laughs> 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 Maybe too much to expect that it's perfectly clear at this point, but um, is that okay? Okay. So. The question I'm meant to be asking you is, are all memories quasi-memories? Can you put up your hand if you think the answer to that is yes? Are all, qua are all memories quasi-memories? Okay. Uh, and if you think the answer is no? Okay. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about? If you do know perfectly well what I'm talking about, but you just don't know what the answer is, okay, well, <laughs> hello? <laughs> you, can't, you can't abstain on all of those. Um, okay. Um, yes, of course, all um, memories are uh, quasi-memories, because to be a memory, you've got to meet these three conditions. To be a quasi-memory, you've just got to meet two of them. So if you meet all three conditions, you automatically meet two of them. You see what I mean? Yeah. Yes? Um, that uh, you have the impression that things were so back then, yeah, that uh, you were at the Taj Mahal, um, and that uh, that memory is causally dependent in the right kind of way on the Taj Mahal having been this and so that evening, that autumn evening so long ago. Yeah, um, those were the two conditions. And the third one was you had to be there. You had to be the one that was doing it. Okay, okay, okay. Um, so I said, as I said, the way to remember what a quasi-memory is is always by way of that example of a brain slide. Um, and then with that, uh, we define the later person is identical to the earlier person if the overwhelming majority of the later person's memory impressions are 
caused by the right kind of way by what the earlier person, John, did. Yeah? That was Shoemaker's definition of obstructing my right thing. Okay. We had that example of the, um, the classic example that you guys brought this up in discussion in different ways. But the retired general remembers being an officer. The officer remembers being a mischievous boy. But the general doesn't remember being a mischievous boy. So if you say memory is what makes it identity, then uh, you're going to wind up with the result that the retired general is identical to the officer, that the officer is identical to the boy, but that the retired general is not identical to the boy. Yeah? Which is, must be a mistake. That's a contradiction. Yes? Okay. So how do we get around that? How do we get around that class? Yes? He remembers both? Who does? He doesn't remember being a mischievous boy. He can remember both. No, you, you, <laughs> you don't understand the effects of aging. I mean, <laughs> all that military life has got to him. Um, he doesn't have the cells anymore. But he could, it's possible, there would be a different kind of example in which he does remember both, yeah? The right thing is perfectly possible that he remembers one but not the other. Yeah? Yep. He has the memory, he just can't access it. That again is another possibility, but um, one of the uh, troubles of getting to be an aged general is that you may not even have the memory anymore. You know, those memories from your really early life some of them may just be gone for good. Is this why you get so excited when you see people who can remember everything and all their memories? Uh, at a certain time, you have all your memories. Well, when he's in his midlife, a vigorous officer, yeah, um, and so he, he might have full memory of all his earlier life, but he doesn't have memory of what happens later. If you see what I mean, yeah. So there's no point at which, there may be no point at which your memories of all, everything that came from all of your life. Uh, yes? That's right. That's right. Very good. Okay, so what you want to say is that, uh, it, uh, the right, uh, to be the right kind of causal connection, you have to don't do it. You don't have to do it directly. Yeah, you can get a co uh, one kind of causal connection between two relatively short time periods, and a chain of those will be enough for the right kind of causal connection for identity between two long periods. Right. Okay. Yeah, I think that. Yeah. That too is entirely possible. I mean, it's al always said that people uh, lose their memories as they get older, but there is a flip side, which is um, that as you get older, memories, particularly from e early adulthood, get much easier to access. Yeah. So that too is possible. It's possible that um, the, of the officer might not remember being a mischievous boy, but then in old age, it comes back to him. Yeah, you, you know, that's how you get to the old gaffer mumbling away over the chimney piece, uh, you know, <laughs> yarning about the days, great days gone by. Um, so that, that too is a possible scenario. In that kind of case, though, if you r remember the thing that someone mentioned a second ago about memory traces, um, the trace could presumably have had to be there all the way through. Yeah. So he had the trace, even though he couldn't access it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, anything else on that? Any other suggestions? Yeah, so I think what Parfit would certainly say is what um, uh, last question about one said. You've got a chain from uh, the retired general to the gallant officer. That's the kind of thing that Parfit is calling cause of psychological connectedness. Yeah, that's a short term thing. <coughs> and then if you've got a chain of those psychological connectednesses, then that's enough for identity. Yeah. So one way people put it is in terms of, if you think about what ha the relation of being a parent, 
that's like a short-term solution, right? You can't have more than two parents, yeah? I mean, right, well, you, can, you can have all that, more than two all that many more than two parents, right? Um, and whereas you can have thousands and thousands of ancestors, um, to be, for X to be an ancestor of Y is for there to be a chain of parent-child relations connecting X and Y, yeah? So you can, uh, people sometimes call this thinking the ancestral over relation, taking a chain of that, uh, of examples of that relation. So that's what we're doing here. We're taking those short-term psychological connectednesses and saying, take the ancestral of that. Um, the, the relation expands to that short-term psychological connectedness, the way ancestor does to parent. One other thing about the basic idea here, remember the thing about the desk, uh, 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 being annihilated and having exactly similar desk created, and we said, well, it wouldn't be the same desk because it would just be an accident. It looked like the earlier desk. Um, that shows that the identity of a concrete object is a, a causal notion. Um, is it clear what I mean causal? What I mean causal is something like um, the way it was earlier makes a difference to the way it is now. If it had been different earlier, it would have been different now. So long as it was similar earlier, it was going to be similar now. Uh, something like that? Yeah. Um, I mean, that needs to be made a bit more precise, but that is the intuitive idea. The way it is earlier is making a difference to the way it is now. Um, so uh, for the later desk to be identical to the earlier desk is for there to be a chain of causal connections from the later desk to the earlier desk. This is true for, ob and for animals, you do the same thing. The later animal is identical to the earlier animal if the biological condition of the later animal causally depends on the biological condition of the earlier animal. Or at any rate, if there's a chain from the later animal back to the earlier animal. Yes? You don't understand what I mean by causally connected? You don't see why it is causally connected. Okay, watch a simple demonstration, right? A simple demonstration, right? I have here a simple piece of chalk, yep. I put an X on the desk, right? There is an X on the desk now. Why is there an X on the desk now? Because I put an X on the desk earlier, right? Because I put an X on that very desk earlier, right? Okay, now well, watch me very closely here, right? Here is the lectern, okay? I also put, <laughs> I hope the next person in the class does not mind, but okay. I also put an X in the lectern, right? Yes? Why is there an X in the lectern now? Okay. Is there an X in the lectern now because I put an X in the desk earlier? No, right? It had to be the same object. It's because I put it on this very object earlier that it's on this very object now. An object is a kind of vehicle for transmitting the marks of the past into the future. Yeah? That's what you are. You are a kind of vehicle for transmitting the marks of the past into the future. That's what memory is, the way that the past impacts you and uh, uh, generates your future memories. Okay? Is that reasonably intuitive? Yeah? Okay. Um, Okay, so so much for connectedness and continuity. <coughs> plain as day? It's not going to be plain. I mean, just, uh, despite my best efforts to make it um, difficult, uh, um, <laughs> that, that's plain as day. Yeah, okay. Okay. So then the question Parfit is raising, with these two basic ideas in mind, the question he's raising now is, what about printing off? Once you've got that notion of psychological continuity, causal continuity, a chain of causal connections from the past into the future, you can see that you could have that even though there was branching. If this desk branched, there would be X's on all three future desks because of the X I put there now. Yeah, that could happen. I mean, I'm not saying it happens very often, but it could happen in principle, yeah. So if you had printing off, um, you'd have psychological continuity across all the branches. But when you've got uh, a single thing being printed off into three, are the three things that come out at the end identical to the original one? Are they identical to each other? 
are those three print-offs identical to each other? If you just think about the desk visioning, yeah? So we've got three desks here. Are those three desks identical to each other? No, they are very similar. But if they were one and the same desk, how many desks would there be here? One, right? But what was my hypothesis? There are three desks. Yes? I mean, <laughs> I know there are doctrines that you can have three in one, but um, you, for the case of a simple desk, it's pushing it a bit, right? I mean, if you've got three desks here, you've got three desks, they're not one in the same desk, right? Although they're very similar. So if you've got printing off, you've got three different things here. Yes? Are those three things causally, directly causally connected to one another? Is there a chain of causal connection from one to the other? No, there is not, right? Um, so how can they be identical? They're not identical. They're three different things. So are any of them identical to the original thing? Are they all identical to the original thing? Okay, put up your hand if you think they're all identical to the original thing. Okay, boy, I would like to hear from you guys. How can they all be identical to the original thing? They're what, their structure is identical. Yeah, they're very similar. I'm not disputing that. But when I say identical, what I mean is, is it one and the same? Yeah? Yeah. If you take one or two identical twins and you say, they're simply identical, those two twins. Right, well, that, I, I, I know what you mean, but you don't mean it's one and the same person. Because if it was one and the same person, it wouldn't be twins. They're only one person in the family, right? You, you see what I mean? They're two different people. Two are clones and one's a real one. Yeah, that, the, the, that is a possible case. Yeah, two are clones and one's a real one. Yeah. I, I, I'm just asking, right at the moment I'm asking, could it be that all three are ident identical to the original one? Of course not. If they were all identical to the original one, they'd all be one and the same as the original one, so they'd all be one and the same as each other. Yes? Okay, I mean, if Superman is identical to Clark Kent, and uh, Superman is the guy who saved my life, then Clark Kent is the guy who saved my life. You, you see what I mean? There's, a, there's no way around that. Yeah, that's identity. Okay, so if you get printing off, you get psychological uh, contiguity, but you go, don't get identity. And although you can imagine cases where you get two clones here and one's the original, that could certainly happen. Um, I mean, people do take clones, right? I mean. Uh, actually, twinning is a basically a cloning process. Someone told me the other day. Um, uh, one is cloned from the other in the womb. Um, uh, that's not the case we're considering here. There's no nothing privileging them over one of these over the other. Yep. There's no basis for saying that one's the original and the others are clones. They're all in equal standing. Yep. Yes. Do you have a question? Yes. Uh, uh, Locke didn't really pursue the thing at this level, right? L Locke was really inventing the subject, if you see what I mean. And this kind of fine-grained question is something that came up only after people had spent three, se three centuries arguing about the Prince and the Cobbler. Uh, do you see what I mean? It really took a long time to, g to come up with these examples. Yeah. So Locke didn't really go into this kind of thing. Um, all you get in Locke... I, I'll let you come back to Locke on Thursday um, and try to say what I think his deep insight was that's actually been missed in this discussion. But um, um, on, a, on the face of it, he says psychological continuity is enough for identity. Um, but he doesn't address what happens in this kind of case because it simply hadn't occurred to him or anyone else. Uh, yeah. Anything else I missed? Okay. Um, so in this case, these offshoots aren't identical to one another because then there will be only one, not three. They can't all be identical to the original because then there'd be uh, one, not three. And there's no way of making out the case that one of those is the original one and the other two are copies. Yeah? Okay, so no branch is identical to the original. So the importance of these fission cases is they make it clear that you can have psychological continuity 
without identity. Yeah. But, uh, a, a moment ago, we were explaining identity in terms of psychological continuity, causal connections. But now it turns out you can have psychological continuity without identity. Yeah. So what's the relation between identity and psychological continuity? What's the relation between identity and psychological continuity? I've been saying identity is a causal notion. It's when the later thing causally depends on the way the earlier thing was, right? And it seems to be something that we really care about. We really care about each other's identities. Are you the same person I met last night? That kind of thing. Um, uh, and we explain identity in terms of psychological continuity but now it looks like psychological continuity can't be the same thing as identity. Because here we've got psychological continuity without identity. So what is the relation? Is there any relation between psychological continuity and identity? Why can't psychological continuity be identity? Because there is psychological continuity across all three branches here with the original thing. That's right. That's what, that's what I mean. The X in every single disc is caused by the X having gone in the original. That's right. There is the causal connection. That's right. That's right. But is there identity? Are these all one and the same thing? In a weird way. <laughs> You have to raise your game. <laughs> right. uh, wow, okay. Uh, one, two, three, four. Yeah. Sorry, won't it matter? Yes. When you get different matter? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Go together. That's excellent. Yeah. Okay, good. So if you didn't have the branching and had the psychological continuity, then you'd have identity. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. No, I, I think that's right. I don't, I don't know. I am defenseless against that. The, 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 all this establishes is that when you have branching, you can have psychological continuity without identity. It's consistent with that to say what you just did, that if you've got psychological continuity, but you don't have branching, then you have identity. Yeah? So, th I, I mean, in the face of it, that's, that's just the right way to deal with it. That's the kind of brute force way a mathematician would deal with this thing. Yeah? Don't branch, <laughs> right? What if you get branching? Okay, don't branch, right? If you don't <laughs> branch, then you've got identity, right? The, yeah. Uh, so, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, what's right for is that the, the causal connection to the original might get attenuated as you go on, yeah? Uh, but really what you're talking about here is not identity, because you're not talking about identity after this um, point, after the fission happens. You are talking about causal connections. Um, but, and what you, you w w what's right in what you're saying is those causal connections will fade and get attenuated as the thing goes on. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, th there was, okay, oh yeah, here, yeah. No, sorry. Just to come at this other question as well. I mean, so if I think that I have a causal idea for what I want, and then I think I can use it, like illegally, can I use my idea of why I want to have a causal idea for what I want to do? I just want to think about it for a second. Like, well, I understand why I want to be separate, but now I'm trying to think about the reasons why I want to be separate. Can I use that to think about it? Because then at the same time, Okay, you mean why aren't these all one and the same thing? Yeah, why aren't these all one and the same thing? Okay, well, um, 
th there is a, a way of getting that effect here. Um, I mean, th these are th there are three things here, right? Uh, well, there are different ways you could take what you're saying. Uh, would you want to say that at this point there are three disks with the disk fission? Or would you want to say that there's one disk? Oh, they're very similar, but... One and the same. Uh, one and the same means that there's only one thing here. Yeah? If you come to visit me, and then an hour later you come to visit me, and um, uh, someone says to me, how many visitors did you have this morning? Well, how many visitors did I have this morning? Two very similar visitors, or just one visitor twice? Yeah, I just had one visitor, yeah. Um, and it's, I, can't, I, can't, I can't say, well, it was, it was two different guys, but they were very, very similar. Uh, yeah? Um, one and the same means there's just one. It's connected to counting. You, you see what I mean? Yeah. Um, that's why you've got to say three at the end there. Yeah. You, you can soften the effect by talking about the world are very similar. They are very similar. They're highly similar but they're not one in the same. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Components. That, that's an interesting <laughs> idea. There's a sense in which it's evolution in that in evolution, the, the way the thing is later is causally affected by the way the thing was earlier, yeah. right? Um, um, subordinate or a component is a, is a, it's not clear that's the right notion here. I and mean, if you think about yourself as you were a day ago yesterday, right? Are you a component of that earlier self? You're causally affected by the way you were yesterday. The way you are now, is a result in part of the way you were yesterday. Yeah. But that doesn't mean you're a component or subordinate to the way you were yesterday. Oh uh, yeah. You, you, this is you. Yeah. Uh whether memory is quasi memory, yes. <laughs> right. There has to be another component, yeah. So wh what's the other component? You, does that mean that there's no branching? Because if there's branching, there's going to be more than one thing. Yeah, so I mean, this is another vote for that thing about the, we don't want any branching. Yeah, that's right. No, I think that's I think that's right. I think that's completely right. Yeah, yeah. I think it shows that identity has two components. There's a causal connection thing, and there's a branching thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Could I give a simple example? Um, well, a, a really simple example of this happening in real life might be like um, an amoeba. Um, I mean, I don't. <laughs> I don't have the technical vocabulary to explain this properly, but I'm told that an amoeba is kind of like this, right? Um, and so it kind of um, blobs along, right? It's a kind of simple, not m is it one cell? Uh, no, how many cells in an amoeba? One, yeah, okay. And then um, after a bit, it kind of blobs into two. You, you, you see what I mean? Yeah, and now you get two amoeba. And which of them is identical to the original? How many amoeba have you got here now? Two, two right. Um, can they both be the same? Here is the original one from, a, from some time ago. Here is T2, here is T1. Yeah, very good fission. Yeah, and you can raise all the same questions with the amoeba that we were raising here. Amoeba has no memories. No, it has causal connections to the past. Yeah, if you put an X <laughs> in the amoeba <laughs> here, <laughs> right, it might be brutal, <laughs> but um, I don't know. If you injected an X into the amoeba here, that will affect how the later amoebas are. Yeah, you see what I mean? You can do that too. I mean, 
You can try this at home. No, 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 no. That's not that's not the way fission works. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, that's yeah, that, but that's important. Yeah, the the, the X is going. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Uh, one, please. That's another way of explaining it. Yeah. Well, I, I'm not talking about that because then you get, uh, it, it, it's fine to put it in terms of a brain, of brain splitting in the two halves of the brain, being put into different bodies. Um, you, you can't do that. It raises kind of complicated questions about uh, the relative importance of what each half of the brain is doing. Yeah. Um, that's why when I originally presented it, I said, look, take me going left, take me going right, and now imagine me doing both at once. Just imagine that very pure science fiction case. Yeah, um, because then then you just abstract away from these complications about what exactly each half of the brain is doing. But yeah, but part of it does put it in terms of bra brain halves. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So going back to your uh, original question, yeah. I'm just curious if you um, you take um, either a, a neuroplasticity or a neuroplasticity test and compare it to something like that. Yes. What is the difference between the two? The well, um, the amoeba over here will be older and wiser, um, and uh, you know more uh, more resigned and fatalistic than the amoeba here. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, maybe that's pushing it a little bit, but um, uh, th 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 there will be differences. Yeah, um, the, the 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 serious thing is what I'm saying is um, they are causally connected. Not that you are causally connected to the way you were yesterday, even though you may be sadder and wiser after the intervening events. You see what I mean? So you're not exactly the same. But what happened yesterday has causally affected the way you are today. So there won't be exact similarity between the way a thing is earlier and the way it is later. The important thing is that the way it is er late earlier is affecting the way it is later. Yes, that's right. So if you, if you just get this case, um, where you get a single amoeba through the time, yep. But you're saying that it has to be one and the same thing. That's right. Yeah. All right, it's one so and the same. I guess my question is, if it's exactly the same thing and it's very similar to the law, yes. then how is one of the other things that I'm having in my head playing? How can identity not be in bed? Yeah, it really is puzzling. I mean, it is genuinely puzzling. Um, you would think that in order to know whether identity is being maintained, as you put it, yeah, you just have to look at this one and this one. Who cares about what's going on in the rest of the world, right? If you want to know where the, whether the earlier X is identical to the later Y, you just have to look at X and Y, and what's going on with anything else, else should be completely irrelevant, yeah? Um, so if you're just going to look at whether this one's identical to this one, you should be able to just look at this and that. And who cares what's happening over here? Um, and your point is, what's happening in here is the, just the same as what's happening in here. Yep. Um, so how can you justify saying this isn't identity? Yeah. So I think that is a really natural line of thought. It is just a basic puzzle in this area because um, it, <laughs> it seems very compelling what you're saying, but it just can't be right because, um, I mean, this is one of these things where both the statement and it's contradictory, it seemed compelling. But if you follow that line of thought, you wind up with the idea that there's only one thing here. Yeah, only one thing in that situation. There are three things there. Yeah, uh, so we, we, we have to just ride over that. But it's puzzling, I, I agree. Uh, yes? We have to, ch what does that mean? We have to change it, uh, uh, I yes. Yes. Uh, 
identity is a very simple notion. Uh, you know, one and the same is a very simple notion. And it's very hard to see how you make any differences to it. L let me suggest one thing that, uh, I mean, here is something David Lewis suggested. Um, um, you could, uh, uh, Lewis had the notion of a person stage, which is like, if you look at you through time, if you look at you over time, you're kind of stretched out. So take a kind of slice of you as you are at this moment, right? And now take a slice of you as you are a moment later. Now, there are lots of per slices of persons, yeah? Um, and all those slices of persons, those person stages, are causally connected to one another. That's all right? Following me so far? Okay, so we can talk about a person stage or a person slice, and we can talk about a person as a set of stages that are causally connected to one another, right? Now, suppose you take um, my set of slices as I stand here right now, from here, from now to now, right? So that's just a little set of slices, yeah? Is that a person? Um, well, it, if that's a person, then there are actually two people talking to you right now because um, um, I, um, I, I, I hope to live to a ripe old age, and I may yet do it, right? Yes? Um, and uh, but whereas that little bit there has gone forever. So if that was a person, and my whole life is a person, then there were actually two people uh, during that period. You see what I mean? Because these are different things. So you don't want that. So if Lewis says a person is a maximal set of person stages, Take a set of person stages and take the biggest one you can find that has those person stages in it and they're all causally connected to one another. That's what a person is. That's all right? Yeah? So a person is a maximal set of person stages. So think about the person stages along here. Boop, 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 boop. Okay. So all these person stages. Is this one a maximal set of person stages up to the join? No. Why not? Right, because if you've got to put them in the beginning slice, right, they're all causally connected too. So this whole thing up here is a maximal set of person stages. Yep, that's what a person is. And what about this one? Where's the maximal set of person stages here? All the way down, right? So that whole thing is another maximal set of person stages. So this one here, you've got to go all the way down again, right? That's another maximal set of person stages. So how many maximal set of person stages have you got here? Three, okay, so um, down here, right, um, these uh, person stages right at the start are elements of three different maximal sets of person stages, yeah? Okay, so that means that suppose that it really turns out to be true that I'm going to fission at some point in the future um, so that in a year's time uh, um, I'm going to split into two then how many people are standing here talking to you now? Two. No, nope, two. <laughs> because the, the elements of these person stages right here now are elements of two, ma two different maximal sets of person stages. Look, this is what you just said. Here I am talking to you right now. There's my upcoming fission, right? So we said there's this maximal set of person stages and there's this maximal set of person stages. And indeed, there's this one. Yeah? So the stages that stand here talking to you right now are elements of three different maximal sets of person stages. No. <laughs> Remember I said maximal, right? Can't be just a little bit, yeah? As of now, yes, yeah, maximal up till now, yeah, but that's not the way you count a person. I mean, it's not like I die right now. Yeah, I, 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 I'm continuing in existence for a good long time, if it all, if it all serves me. Um, yeah, you see what I mean? So one way, a, a, radical, a, a radical move to get around this is what Lewis did and say, in a case of fission, there were actually three people there the whole time, or two people there the whole time. I mean, this view has generally been thought to be brilliant but unsound. Um, <laughs> right. 
But I, I just want to mention that because people were saying, well, you need some radical rethinking here. Well, that is one kind of radical rethinking, yeah. Um, yeah? You're making you're making a point. Yeah. Yeah. You're making a point about what you know when, right? If I don't know right now, I'm going to fission, and then I do know that I fissioned, yeah, or that there was fission. Um, that, that that's fine, but this is not a point about knowledge. This is a point about suppose this is what really happened, yeah. Then what is the right way to describe the situation? I'm not thinking about what anybody knows when. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's right, they just separated. Yeah, they were different the whole time, but they just they just each came into their own, as it were, yeah. Um, that, that's right. Uh, it's, it is a way of resolving all the formal puzzles about fission, yeah. It's very elegant. Th 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 that's why it's worth mentioning to you right now. Um, it has a kind of force. But as someone said, please, not two people, <laughs> right. It, it just seems too um, breathtakingly wild to, 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 to most people to say the right is a stand right here, here right now. There are two people speaking to you, or five, or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, it just seems completely incredible. Um, it, you can't believe that. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, no, because none of these three people have got a divisible mind. There are actually two different minds talking to you right now in this picture. It, neither of them is divisible. How does what? No, that's not the way it works. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> they're in the same place at the same time. The, the, the doing the same thing, yeah. No, there you go too far. <laughs> okay, we, we should move. I, I, uh, one, two, three. Yeah. Yes, I agree that's a natural question, Yeah, but though clearly they weren't independent because up until the time of the fission, they were composed of the very same atoms. So it's not an accident that they just randomly happened to do the same thing. Um, by the laws of physics, they had to be doing the same thing because they're made of the very same atoms Yeah, up until the fission. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, we have two things and they can't both do the same thing. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So then, is the point that they're not having two things in the same thing? Two things. They can't be one, two different things can't be one and the same thing. The, 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 that's the point. It's a simple logical point. If you It, it doesn't really matter whether it's time or not. It, it's, it's just whether you've got two different things or one thing. Yeah, um, And when I say logical, I don't mean to imply that it's technical. I just mean it's particularly obvious, particularly compelling. You know, you just get a contradiction if you deny this. Two different things can't be one thing. Yeah, um, That's all. And if this is the same thing as that, and that is the same thing as that, then this would have to then... Well, that's, you, that, that's what this uh, thing suggests, that this would have to be two different things. Either that or these two would have to be the same thing. I said we, we, sh we should move on. Let me just, if, there, if there's anything you can hold, please put it on hold. Okay, so if you have that, as I do actually have that, oh, please, please not to <laughs> reaction to, to that kind of analysis, then I think the only thing that's left is to say that identity is psychological continuity and no branching, right? That was a suggestion that you guys were coming up with. Identity is a special case of psychological continuity. You can define identity as psychological continuity and no branching. So, um, 
Um, actually, let me just skip over this a little bit because time is pressing on. Um, we had this definition from Shoemaker, uh, the later person is integral to the earlier person, or if the overwhelming majority of those uh, later person generalizations are caused in the right kind of way by the earlier person generalizations. And you've got to add, and there isn't any branching, right? You need that for your definition of identity. So you've got this um, causation in the fission case. And so even in the case of the table, what we were saying was um, it's not enough that the later table causally depends on the earlier table. You've got to add, and there isn't any branching. So um, if we're going to say uh, sameness of the person is sameness of the physical body, if Williams is going to say sameness of the person is sameness of the physical body, what that means is the condition of the later body be causally depends on the way the earlier body was and there isn't any branching. So if you're going to say, I really want it to be me, if there's going to be an earthquake and everyone in the room doesn't make it except for one, and I want that one person to be me, right? That's why I always sit right next to the door, yeah? Um, then um, if you want it to be me, right, what you're saying there is, what I want is that the one person who makes it out of here should be causally connected to this person and there, should be no, and there should not be any branching. So identity is causal continuity without branching. Yeah? Okay, and now we put the bite on. Um, what does that tell us about the concern to survive? Now, now we get the critical, now, now, now here's a critical point. If you're saying, uh, this, the, 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 someone told you there's only be one person that makes it out of the room, and you say, uh, oh, I want it to be me. Well, you say, I want it to be me because he or she is identical to me. Um, or you can say, because I want causal continuity between the person that makes it out and me. Right? You can you, you, these are two different ways of thinking of it. Um, so suppose you say, well, the future person matters. What I care about in the life of this future person matter is that the future person should be identical to me. Well, what's identity? Identity is causal continuity and there's no branching. Now, I think if you just think about it at that abstract level, you can see why causal continuity should matter, right? You want, I mean, everybody wants that the world later should have some, bear some impact from what you did now. Right? If someone says Steve Jobs li lives on in the iPad or something like that, yeah, then, um, or, 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 or in the cultural revolution he generated, right? well, I don't say it's much help to Steve Jobs, but that's the kind of thing you would like, right? I mean, academics care passionately about that kind of thing, that they're, uh, just to take the profession I know best, but they want some impact of them to live on in the future. Um, you want your friends or your family to remember you. You want there to be some lasting impact of what you're doing, yeah? Um, so applying that uh, to your concern with a future self, wanting that there should be a future self that is very closely causally connected to your current self, that seems to make perfect sense. But if you care about identity, that's saying, oh, look, I really care about branching. Branching is really important. I really matter, I should be concerned about branching. Well, causal continuity with your current self is a reasonable concern. I mean, caring about what happens to your children is a reasonable concern. I mean, caring especially about ha what happens to your children because they're the ones that you're causally involved with, um, that really seems like a reasonable concern. But, I mean, <laughs> if, you're, if you had uh, one child and you really care about it, well, that's all right, right? You care about it because it's causally connected to you. But suppose you have three children and in that sense, there was branching. So you can say, oh my God, there was branching. Um, I mean, right? I, so I can't care about any of them. Um, I accept that they're all causally very s related to me, but there was that terrible branch. And now I think, oh no, 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 no. Um, <laughs> right? that, that would be a very unusual reaction. I mean, it's one that is fine. It, it makes perfect sense to care about causal connectedness <laughs> to you. But um, caring about branching is really kind of crazy. Um, 
I mean, just if you say, I care about branching, how can you possibly justify that or even make it intelligible? Um, another way to think of it is to think of these um, exploded diagrams we had uh, where you say, well, I can, get, I can show the person is like made up of these components. And now you realize that all you care about when you care about me, um, when you say, I really care about my survival, is that um, you realize that all that's going on is that in this room right now, there are all these strings of experiences causally connected to particular bodies. And when you say, I care about the continued survival of this person, what you're saying is, I care about the, the prolongation of the string of experiences causally connected to this body. So, but, but why should you do that? It's kind of like rooting for one football team as opposed to another. Yeah? I mean, <laughs> the, the reason it's fun is there isn't any objective ground for... I mean, some people do... So you do sometimes get people who root for a particular football team because they're the most successful. You know, they're the one that has most wins. That is a very shallow and thoughtless kind of person. Yeah? I mean, rooting for a particular football team is arbitrary. I mean, it's fun to pretend it's not, right? But it really is arbitrary. You're not g it's not based on anything. You just root for this one. So when you realize that you can analyze itself in terms of a bunch of components, you realize, I'm just rooting for this string of experiences, and there is something arbitrary about it. Here's part of it. We are strongly inclined to believe that our continued existence is a deep further fact, distinct from physical and psychological continuity. When I believed that my existence was such a further fact, there's the essential me, and I care about whether that makes it. I seemed imprisoned in myself. My life seemed like a glass tunnel through which I was moving faster every year, and at the end of which there was darkness. When I changed my view, when I realized that all that's going on is that I am rooting for the prolongation of the causal influence of a particular set of experiences in a particular body. When I changed my view, the walls of my glass tunnel fell away. I now live in the open air. There is still a difference between my life and the lives of other people, but the difference is less. So, the point of this kind of technical analysis of what you're caring about, when you care about yourself, when you say what's in it for me, is to undermine why you, oh, 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 that kind of obsessive picture on which you're in the glass tunnel. If what you care about is causal impact in the future, on analysis you can see that that's what's going on, then um, you realize that that effect could be had without the continuance of your identity. And there may be lots to be discussed about what kind of causal influence in the future you want to have. Okay, I'll just pause for a second. Uh, oh, you want to see this again? When I believe my existence is a further fact, um, meaning that there's something, the, the essential me, where you might say, well, Either that makes it through fission or it doesn't. Yeah? And if it doesn't, that's the end of the world. Yeah, that's when the light goes out. That's death. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. That, that was the picture in which fission is the same as ordinary death. Because that deep further fact about whether you continue to exist doesn't hold anymore. That's right. That's right. You, 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 can, uh, you can say, well, why do I care about causal continuity? What kind of, kind of causal continuity do I care about? I mean, after all, a great um, war criminal might have a huge causal influence on the world later. But that's <laughs> that should be no consolation to anyone, right? that you think, well, you know, I've left my mark on all these people. Yeah, you see what I mean? 
causal continuity, once you start thinking about causal continuity, causal continuity as such isn't important either. Everything depends on the kind of causal continuity. Um, so you start thinking, well, why do I care about myself so much anyway? Not because I care about branching, and not because I care about causal continuity as such. And now we start to, is l let me just give you another example here. We're, the kind of thing that Parthik's doing here is, um, people often try radical attacks on self-interest, right? I mean, every, you know, any, any pastor is going to say, um, any, any, uh, well, of course, we're all very selfish and we ought not to be so selfish and so on. Um, that's not what Parthid is doing. He's saying, be selfish. Let's stick with the selfishness. Stick with it that you're just out for your own interests and you care passionately about your own survival. Now just pause and put a microscope on that concern. What is it that you're concerned about when you're concerned about with self-interest? What is it that you're concerned about when you're concerned about yourself? So this is not a radical critique. This is saying, let's, let's live with the self-interest and see what it is. So just to give um, an analogy, um, suppose you live in a village where uh, they have baptism. They have a baptism ceremony at which lots of the elders are present and the newborn child is named and initiated. And suppose it's not religious. Suppose it's a secular tradition, right? You can have a baptism ceremony like that. Well, you can imagine two kinds of critiques of that kind of thing. You could say, well, on the one hand, a conservative could say, well, what we all value about the baptism, of course, is not the ceremony itself. It's just that we celebrate somehow the birth of the child and that we bring it into the community. That's what's really important about it. So really, what we want the ceremony for, you could have without um, the actual ceremony itself. You know, if it's very expensive, for example, you could say, let's not bother having the ceremony. We could equally well get this effect without the ceremony. Yeah? Exactly. You, exactly. You could say, look, what do, what do we really value about marriage? Um, uh, and one kind of critique would be the things that are important to anyone about marriage, you could have without the actual ceremony itself. Yeah, that, that, that's a very familiar kind of thing. So that's a conservative critique in the sense that it keeps in place the structure of the concerns that motivate the ceremony, but it says there are maybe other or better ways to satisfy those concerns. You, you see what I mean? It's not challenging the concerns we have. It's just saying there are better ways to get the effect. On the other hand, a radical critique would say, actually, what we should be doing is growing children in test tubes and sending them all off to live in communes. Um, you know, we don't go for any of that stuff that the baptism said. That, that would be a radical critique, right? We should be designing the children in test tubes, and they should all be being brought up in communes. That would be a much more effic efficient thing to do. So you could say, look, forget about your ordinary concerns. I'm going to stand right outside that, redesign the whole thing from scratch. Now, that's what somebody's doing when they say, don't be so selfish. They're saying, anyone's reaction to that is, but I've got to look out for myself. You know, that's... This is part of your um, task in life, right? Some minimal looking out for yourself is just required. Um, so it's not really, it's not, you can't stand outside on Mars and look at us all from the outside and then have some way of critiquing what we're going on. I mean, the problem is if you do reach that kind of radical critique, that radical perspective, that Martian perspective, then you don't have any idea um, uh, what you'd want. St you've got to stick with our actual concerns. So a radical attack on self-interest says, well, my death doesn't matter any more than anyone else's. Look at it from the standpoint of the cosmos. My death is not important. But that's not what Parthed is saying. Parthed is saying, don't radically challenge self-interest. Just ask, what is it that you're concerned about when you're concerned about yourself? Just as you might say, what is it that I value about marriage? Or what is it that I value about baptism? Um, so he's giving a conservative critique. What concerns us in self-interest? Couldn't we get that, what we really care about, without concern for the self? So when you put the microscope on what you're concerned about with self-interest, you realize there's kind of junk in there. There's stuff about um, branching that really, who cares whether I branch or not? That's not important. Or you say, um, uh, 
uh, I'm really concerned about the continuance of this set of components. Well, why should I care about that? Um, and you can ask lots of questions you couldn't ask before. When you have that explosion view, you can now start asking, well, what do I care about in this causal relation? What kind of causal connection is important to me? Couldn't there be cases in which you say, I can have the causal impact on the future world in a way that's better than um, uh, if, I, if this body continues to exist? So th this is um, the naive picture that is natural to have. I mean, the naive picture that is natural to have is what I care about when I'm wondering if I make it through to 2014 and thinking that that's terribly important is that there be one and the same thing as me in existence in 2014. But you break it down. Is this body and complex of experiences being causally effective in a later body and complex of experiences? And then um, the self has really vanished. What I care about really is not the survival of the self, but the causal continuation of um, a bundle of things. And you've now subverted that self-interest uh, from the inside. What I really care about is that the string of experiences going out into the future that's causally related to my current experience, to these current experiences and this body, that that should be as long-lasting and rich as possible. So we've got a microscope on self-interest now, and you can subvert it from the inside. Okay. Um, we haven't got that much time left, but the idea was that, that we, it might be good to hear what people were doing for the essay. I mean, <laughs> deadline is a terrible word, um, but um, um, the, the deadline is, is, is Thursday. And are, are you guys up for this? <laughs> Some of you look pretty hurt. Uh, we were going to do the, he, hear what theses people were going to argue for in the essay. Yep. Okay, so the thesis is that Huxley is wrong about epiphenomenalism. Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. So epiphenomenalism is wrong. Yeah. Okay, very good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I'd like to spring people a little bit because there's some of you guys I never hear from, and I just like to know how you're thinking about this thing. You don't have to. You don't have to speak if you'd rather not. You can pre-desist. But um, <laughs> um, so you, I, I just caught your eye. So. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. So, so Jack, Jackson was right. Uh, the thesis is Jackson was right as against physicalism. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you don't think it's just one physical world? His argument, the Mary argument. Because what, sorry? <laughs> oh, yeah, this is, uh, th th they are all hard topics. <laughs> um, okay, let's just go down this. Uh, you, you, let's just arbitrarily fasten in this section. Identi okay, uh, so you're, you're agreeing with Williams and saying identity doesn't matter the way, uh, I mean, memory doesn't matter the way Locke said. Yeah, very good. Yeah. So you, you, you have to take on the, the prince and the cobbler head on and say body swaps are impossible. Is, is that right? Is that what you mean? Right, so, but you're... Yeah, are you going to say that memory switches don't make sense? Good, yeah, yeah, excellent, yeah. Okay, the identity thing, yeah. Very good, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. 
That's great. That's a very interesting case. So he's got all the apparent memories from be from earlier, but he doesn't have any sense of ownership of them. He doesn't. He feels like that wasn't me. Yeah. What does that to do with me? So, is it really him? Yeah. That's yeah. <coughs> great question. Great case. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Right at the back, in the, in the far corner. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's why you're sitting at the back. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, person beside you. Is Sorry. Hi. Okay. Nagel, th Nagel's thing shows that physicalism and functionalism can't be the whole story, yeah. 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 So what more is it? Yeah. Okay. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, you, uh, uh, the green guys, yeah. yeah. Oh, I see. So, in principle, you can find we could find out everything there is to know about the bat. Yeah, maybe. Okay. So it just shows how some ideas are just like right. Well, actually, what I love about all the theses that people people have put so forward so far is that they are nice, strong theses. You, you see what I mean? The, 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 this is great. I mean, the, the whole point of setting up the essay in this way is to ask you guys to nail your colours to the mast. <laughs> you know, or if, if that's the phrase I want. Um, so that's great. So don't be afraid to go for a strong thesis. I, I mean, <laughs> subject to the recommend of you invited in GCI, GSI. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So boy, this is quite a strong anti-physicalism. <laughs> Instead of responses, but the person next to you, yeah. Uh, it is better. Epiphenomenalism is better than dualism. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I mean, it's not. You, it's hard to believe, though, isn't it? Epiphenomenalism. But your point is. The argument forces you there. Is that, is that what you're saying? Yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, nobody would say about epiphenomenalism. Yeah, that's what I've always thought. <laughs> you, you see what I mean? It's <laughs> um, or actually, it would be very unusual if any right, if you were like that. But yeah, the, the, that the argument forces you there. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, somebody else who doesn't, who, 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 whose views I don't know that well. Um, uh, in the, uh, I don't know what the word is, scarlet, crimson, um, the, the woman with scarlet, lady with scarlet. Yeah. Is that Jackson and? Jack Jackson's thing about physicalism. Are you for it or against it? I mean, what's the line? What's your line? Against physicalism, boy, physicalism is taking a pounding. Is, it <laughs> is anyone going to argue in favour of physicalism? Whoa, <laughs> okay, right. <laughs> okay, you, <laughs> what, 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 okay, I guess I know what you're thinking. Right. Uh-huh, oh, very good, okay, that sounds, yeah, what's, what's the untrue premise? Right, very good. Yeah, let's go. Let's just see what you guys are doing. Um, so you're um, doing the same thing where you're saying that you can think about concepts as being different from the actual ones, um, and you're comparing them against each other. Yes. So, like, for example, like, um, 
Okay. Okay, these are great lines. Yeah. Uh, yes? Does Nagel have a definition of physical agent? Yeah. Very good. Great. Okay. Yeah. I would like to know more about the concept of general relativity to the extent you can say that some things do not change at all, and some things do change very strongly to the uh -huh. extent that you can strangle it as a vector. So just like some things that you're changing very strongly to, as you can see two different lines of data. Okay, this is great. Okay, <laughs> this is <laughs> quite a dialogue between you guys and the guys who came up earlier. <laughs> um, okay, just another couple. You, what, what are you? Uh, are you? Yeah. yeah. No, no. What? what who, we just talked about a whole ton of stuff. Oh, what? what? Uh, uh, Yes, right. So, yeah. Okay, very, I see. Okay, so, so that's a state that you need some kind of from the inside understanding of what went on yeah. in order to be the person. Yeah. Is it, is that, is it, would that be yeah. a sound bite? Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. No, 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 you put your personal view in at the start. But, uh, 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 I'm sorry, <laughs> that's the whole idea. That it's not like meant to be a mystery what your personal view is. It just The reader is absolutely agog when it comes out right at the end. You, you've got to get away from that. Put, put your per I strongly encourage you to put your personal view right at the start. Yeah, but anyway, carry on. Yeah. Okay, that's good. That's pretty. That, 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 that's a pretty sophisticated kind of state. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Is we do. We just have a couple of minutes. Uh, anyone else? No. Yeah. Um, oh, Huxley and the frogs and eighty phenomenalism. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, um, on Thursday, we'll do one last time on identity, and then we'll move on um, to the next phase. Okay, great. Thanks, guys.